I clicked right the red the button. button. Yeah, the red button? Yes. <laughs> Got it. Yep. All right, can you you can hear okay? Yes, I'm good. All right, and so you you should be able to hear yourself when you talk, right? Like Let me if you, see if I can. I mean, I can hear myself talking. Yeah, yeah. Just okay. not in the headphones. No, not in the headphones. You can't. You can't hear yourself in the headphones. No. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> yeah. Eat more, Eat more chicken. But I can hear everyone else. But I know what I'm saying. So I'm good. Jackson, how come I can't hear myself? See, Jackson, there's something up with that. Well, there's something. Some of the something. 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 I don't know. I just guess I have to get more figures. Can y'all hear me? All right. Yeah. Well, okay. just I can hear you. If you st as long as you stay close like this, you can you can tell the difference between this and that. Well, yes. if you can't hear in the headphones, you can't. Okay. It's like a professional studio, man. I'm trying. We're working on it. That's awesome. So. All right, Susie, you started. Yeah. Yeah. Caitlin, you ready? You're recording. Mm-hmm. We're recording everywhere. Daisy started. Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. We're going to start in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast, episode 44, People Management for February 20th, 2013. Special guest today is uh, Luke Wilbanks, the owner and operator of the local Chick-fil-A. So we are, I'm definitely excited to, to have you know, such an important person from our community come and uh, can speak on the podcast because Chick-fil-A has done quite a lot for... Uh, the school district, they're involved with a lot of different things. And I actually was in the uh, great chicken kick, which was the passing high school versus Rayburn football game. It was a field goal kick, and you could possibly win your whole school free Chick-fil-A. However, I failed on the first attempt, so Rayburn won that one. <coughs> but the guy had an advantage, though. He kicked the week before. and. and <laughs> so, so I'm gonna practice, and, and next year I'll be I'll be ready for it. So, but then they've also done lots of other things, like um, they had the, was it the chicken hoop? Yeah. Chicken hoop. So they had like a free throw shooting contest between the Pasadena and Rayburn uh, principal at their at the last game of the season. And again, we came out on the short end, but you know it's a lots of different ways that Chick Fil A is supporting our school district. So, uh, of course, I am your host, Jeremy Jackson. With me today is Susie, Kaylin. Karen. We got Mr. Wilbanks. Yes. Crystal. Leslie. Priscilla. And Claudia. Daisy's on the Google Hangout YouTube. Lodi's taking pictures. Monica's uh, doing a quality control. Check on the audio over there. So if there's a problem with the audio, hopefully Monica can let us know early. If you want to get involved with the conversation, you have questions for uh, any of us or uh, Luke, then you can do that on the Ustream social stream. And then Susie will see those and Either, either reply on to the computer or mention your comment on the air. All right, so just a little bit about Luke before we get started. He has been with Chick-fil-A for 14 years, and he's been an operator for five years. Um, and then he's going to tell us some more about that. But uh, kind of a, a funny story is my wife always says Pasadena is a real small town. Well, Luke is not from anywhere around Pasadena. However, his wife is a friend of mine when I used to go to uh, Sagemont Church in high school, we used to hang out. And so I, I saw his wife at Chick-fil-A and we were talking and then his sister-in-law, it's your sister-in-law, right? Yes. Jan Jana. Jana. And so I was friends with both his wife and sister-in-law when I was in high school. And then he comes from, you know, Dival, Texas to back to Pasadena. And so we're all kind of interconnected just in how small Pasadena is. So, all right. Without much further ado, my camera's way off. Yeah. Good looking out. I bet when y'all hit the cord. All right, so there's a camera right there facing you, Luke. Not okay. this one, but the one oh. right there. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so there we go. And then there's another one, so you can't escape the camera at all. There's lots of cameras covering you. All right, so I talked just a little bit about where you're from, but why don't you go ahead and give us some details on where you're from, college, university, that kind of stuff. Sure. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's good to be in Pasadena. My wife grew up here, um, and so it's kind of exciting to be near where she grew up. So I grew up in Dybal, Texas, which is the metropolis about two hours north of Houston, of about 5,000 people or less uh, since I've left there. And so both my wife and I went to Stephen F. Austin State University. I graduated there in 2005 with a degree in business 
and uh, always did Chick Fil A when I was since I was 16, and just loved it. And so that's kind of how I got started with Chick Fil A. But got a family now. Got two boys. One's a four-year-old. One's a two-year-old, and they're both handfuls at times, especially sometimes in the morning getting dressed. Um, but they're a whole lot of fun. I love them, and so. Uh, that's the best thing about life right now. And so, but excited to be here with y'all and answer some questions about people. Um, not perfect at that, but I uh, have worked with a lot of people and I made lots of mistakes. And so I can really have some insight on that. So thanks uh, for having me. Sounds good. I have a, a two year old son and a seven month old, so, or two and a half year old and seven month old. So we're, we're about in the same boat. It's just you're two years ahead of me, kind of. There we go. So you can learn from my mistakes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> So my wife usually listens in, and if she's listening now, then maybe she'll she'll throw in some questions about uh, you know child rearing when they're two years apart. But maybe she won't. You never know. She can throw in some answers as well. That would be <laughs> probably <laughs> she probably has a lot more answers than I do. So when did you start with Chick Fil A? Chick Fil A. I started when I was 16 as a team member uh, when minimum wage was 515 which I feel like I'm the old guy now because everyone's like, wow, that's so cheap. But I uh, started there. I started working as a team member. I loved it, enjoyed it. I uh, was working there probably six months or a year, and then I realized that I loved the leadership aspect of it. I talked to one of the leaders in the unit, and I said, hey, you know, I'd love to be a leader. And I started doing that, and then I went off to college. Didn't work with Chick-fil-A too much then, but worked at a, another campus, but then I was able to come back to Chick-fil-A. Uh, and started working with them and then about halfway through college didn't really know what I wanted to do I asked my mom I said you know I'm here I don't know what to do um, I love Chick-fil-a I love working I love the church what should I do and it wasn't a big prayer thing or anything like that my mom just said you should do business and so that's kind of when I said all right she said you love people you're good with people and um, you're good with business why don't you try that and so that's kind of the point where I said all right I want to do Chick-fil-a and so it wasn't an easy road to get to the, where I am now as an operator uh, like I said, I've been a general manager. I've worked at several different concepts, some free standards like the one on uh, Fairmont where I own now. I've worked in a mall, worked in low volume situations, high volume sales situations, and so just a lot of different opportunities there. And so, but had this opportunity April 1st, was able to move to Pasadena then. It's one of the top ones in the chain. That's kind of why we were excited about that. But also, this is where my wife grew up. Um, we were in Nacogdoches the past three years. Uh, loved it there, loved the people. The community was excellent. And there was actually only one other store we'd ever have moved for, and it was this one. And it came available, so I figured I'd ask for it. Uh, I was selected. Uh, not sure how, but I'm there. And so, uh, enjoying Pasadena. So that's how I came to be in contact with Chick fil A. All right, so you said low volume and high volume sales. Is that that corporate sales or, or was that in, like just basically slower Chick-fil-A stores? Slower Chick-fil-A stores. I guess There's a range, uh, big range on the uh, on that, and the average uh, does pretty well. But I've been on the bottom end and the top end, and so I was one of the bottom 50 stores at the first store I operated. Now I'm in one of the top 50. And so it's very different at each concept. So. Yeah, we usually if we go to Chick-fil-A, we try to go like about like 11 or like, too because it's always busy but you know even even when it's slam packed it's, it's still there's people waiting outside to take your order and that kind of thing so it's it's pretty efficient pretty good to uh, run business so well thank you it is a big operation with lots of people so. all right so i'm sure we'll hear some more about that in just a minute at what point did you decide you wanted a career with chick-fil-a it was in college, and I uh, taken a business class. I went to East Texas Baptist University for one year, my freshman year of college, before going back to SFA, and just took a business class as a freshman. And at the end of it, the professor said, are you a senior? And I said, well, no, I'm a freshman. And so she was like, wow, well, you really like business? I said, well, I've worked with Chick-fil-A for four or five years now and just really love it and kind of able to learn that. And so um when she said that and what my mom said i said all right let's go with chick-fil-a and so from the team leader standpoint all the way up to operator <laughs> how does chick-fil-a prepare its own or run a franchise excellent thing about chick-fil-a a lot of people think franchises you have a lot of money you put in a lot of money it's actually only five thousand dollars which i know probably sounds like a lot especially to a high school student um, but it's not a lot for a franchise and so but what they do is i tell people i go the biggest thing i've ever heard is that for chick-fil-a you're in business 
uh, for yourself but not by yourself. We have a ton of support staff at the home office. I have an accountant, a business consultant, um, all different kinds of help that assist me and make me better. And in fact, local operators, we get together. In fact, yesterday we had a meeting. There are six of us that meet together and we visit each other's store and kind of give feedback on what was good and bad and ugly and uh, try to help each other make everybody better. Now, when I became an operator, there's a five week course I went through at the home office that they go through legal stuff, they go through people stuff, they go through how to make the chicken sandwich, how to do everything. Everything. And so they really prepare you for that. And so, but I've never felt like I've been out in the cold or, you know, it's just been okay. It's all me out here. Uh, it's a great support team at the home office. And so, all right. So, jumping back a little bit, I uh, saw you put in the show notes you had a plant or salsa stand. Oh, yes. How I got involved in business, I guess, other than Chick fil A. Um, I guess all my life, as I look back on it, I wasn't planning on it when I was 10 or 12 or whenever I did that. But uh, my, uh, friend and I, we always wanted to sell stuff, you know, and so we were in junior high or high school or something. His mom would make a salsa and she made them in big jars. And then we went to Lowe's and picked out some flowers, you know, and we got six in a pack. So we said, hey, let's plant those in different pots and sell those. So in my neighborhood, we set up this little cardboard stand, you know, and I think all the neighbors just came over because they wanted to be nice. They didn't really, I mean, it wasn't like a packed house, but I think they bought just because we were the little kids and they wanted to help us out. And so it was kind of fun because I remember one summer day, it was real hot and we were just thinking, we're like, okay, what can we do? We've got salsa, we got flowers. And I guess our supply chain was pretty cheap because of Lowe's flowers were pretty cheap because we could divide them up. But then the salsa, his mom kind of gave it to us for free. So that doesn't happen in the real world. Um, but uh, we, we were thinking one day, we're like, man, they're cu the customers are coming over. They're hot. What if we got them some lemonade? So we went into the house, and of course, my mom had some lemonade packets that we made up. And that's one of the things my friend and I thought about was, hey, they're drinking lemonade. They'll stay at the stand longer. The longer they stay there, the more likely they'll buy something. <laughs> and so it's just funny how I look back on my life and how God kind of prepared it to go, okay, why don't you go into business because of that? And so it was kind of funny how I look back. We didn't really make any money off of it. It, it flopped. Uh, that was my first business, I guess. It flopped. And so I've had several. We had uh, my cousins and I, we sold the paper wind socks. I'm not sure if anyone's ever done that. It looks like a mat. You take a piece of construction paper and you weave uh, other pieces of construction paper in the middle of it and then you roll it up and then you put things on the bottom. You also do that. You'll have iPhones nowadays. Uh, so you probably don't that. <laughs> but we tried to sell those in the uh, rain and it didn't help out at all. So, but failed the business. Construction like paper in the rain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Very cool. Um, and so something else you mentioned, uh, Chick-fil-A preparing you, you said, do they require that, that you've worked for Chick-fil-A for a certain number of time before you can become a uh, owner operator or before you can franchise? They do not. It's about 50, 50 from the last, uh, aspect that I've heard. Um, but basically what happens, you put your application in and the tough thing about Chick-fil-A is because of franchise fee, I guess, of $5,000 initial investment, it's so low, there's a big talent pool that Chick-fil-A pulls from. And I think last year, I had about 25,000 applications to become an operator, and they opened up about 75 stores. And so I've heard Dan and Kathy say before, it's easier to get into the CIA than it is the CFA. And so it's kind of a funny remark because it's not easy to get into because there's some high caliber people in there um, that really want different locations and really want to excel and so but yeah it depends on your background um if you've been working with people it doesn't even have to be restaurant business i mean i talk about people when i hire them at my store sometimes it's better if they're not in the restaurant business because i don't have to retrain them or uh, take out any bad habits but it's just kind of fun to uh, see who does better and so but yeah i think there's different sides of who can come in it just kind of depends on who has that entrepreneurial spirit and really wants to make things happen all right um, I've heard that you don't manage the business, but the people inside. Can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, as I was reading over the notes and I saw that question, it really made me think because I said, you know what? You, you don't really manage people. You kind of leave them. You can manage inventories. Uh, Ross Perot said that, that you manage people. Uh, that you manage inventories and you lead people. And I realized that every business, uh, True Kathy says, we're all in the people business. We just happen to sell chicken. And so whether you're selling cars or whether you're coaching or whether you're uh, in any hospital profession, we all serve people. They're the ones that pay for the product and they're the ones that usually make the product. And so the people that can manage people the best are the ones that win. If you think about Apple, you think about the companies that are really winning. Yeah, they've got a great product. It begins with that. But the reason they stay in business is because of the people they have. When you think about the greatest teams, if they've got one good person, they don't always win. Um, it's the ones that can manage the entire team and manage the people and lead them to want to do better, to do greater things. And so you got to inspire them on that. So, yes, you definitely have to lead the people within the organization if you want to win. 
All right, so so here I am. I'm in a situation where we're we're, we're probably, for the most part, we're gonna with a lot of the same clientele. I have high school kids, so that's a lot of the same people that you're gonna employ there. What are what are some of the things that I can do as an athletic trainer uh, to to make sure that I I hire well, you know, that I screen them well, and then that that I continue to encourage and inspire them from there. So, what what would you do as a as a leader of a successful business with high school? age group i love high school students uh people all kinds of people whether they're grown up or high school or whatever are difficult to work with um we all have families i'm sure you all have a family that you love but you get angry sometimes and upset with each other and you you celebrate together you do kind of all things together but my heart actually goes out to teachers uh, my parents were both teachers at some point in their lives and uh, i didn't realize this but when i went and uh that if you come to work at chick-fil-a and you don't do your job well i just fire you you know, if it doesn't work out. Now, we give you lots of chances. It's not a real mean. You know, we just let you go after one incident. But teachers, my heart goes out to them because they can't just necessarily fire you. I mean, you have to keep coming. And so it's kind of it's kind of what I always say. My heart goes out to teachers, not only because of my parents, but also because of that. But uh, I would definitely say the, there are three things I'm looking for. Let me grab my notes real quick. Make sure I put these in there. I thought about this last night. Three different things that could really help us out on the when you get hired during school or after school if you're going to work for us at Chick-fil-A. And the first one I put is that uh, when you're coaching students, you have to be patient. Um, everyone's got to grow and start somewhere. A lot of times, it's about halfway through my career, I realized that, okay, you know what? I, there was a point when I was learning how to bread the original chicken sandwich. And now I'm getting upset because we didn't train this person correctly, you know? And so... But I can remember I was there at some point, and it just becomes natural for you and easy for you, and it's real easy once you work on it. And so patience, I think, is the first issue. And then number two, I love this from the athletic field, is just a coach's mindset. If you look at coaches, they're awesome at what they do because they're motivating people towards a common goal. It's usually a very clear goal, and uh, they really just give that mindset of, okay, let's, how do we get better? Um, it's never dwelling on the past. You think about it, you learn from it, but it actually pushes you towards the future as well. So I think that really helps. And I think sometimes we get stuck on, okay, what's our last grade? You know, how are we going to do that instead of how are we going to get better? And so and then the final one I have for that was allow them to fail. I think um, that's one thing I th that I've seen in this generation. I don't want to use that cliche of this generation or whatever, but uh, a lot of people are growing up not failing. Um, I asked that in the interview. I go, well, tell me a time when you failed. And nine times out of ten, students today will tell me I've never failed. And it's because I think society has changed a little bit to where everyone gets a trophy. Um, if you just run and you win, uh, you may not win the race, but you get something for it. Um, and I think the real world teaches you not everybody wins. I mean, you lose sometimes. And it's funny. We've got some people at the store that when we uh, tr try to coach them and make them better, they take it personally. Um, because they've never learned how to be told what's not working and, and how to get better. And so they take it personally, and then they can't grow because of that. And so they never get better because they never learned how to fail. So I really actually look for people who have failed um, because it's a good attribute to have. And so I don't know if that helps you on coaching people, um, but that's the three things I was yeah, thinking Yeah, I about, mean, so. I, basically... I've failed before, so I can I can usually usually take coaching, and so that's why I mean I asked the question is, hey, I want to get better, I want to improve the program, I want to have kids that are passing their classes, sticking around, that are working their games, that are attending practice, that are learning how to do CPR and tape, and you know they they desire even if they don't want to be an athletic trainer as a professional, um, that they desire to do the best that they can while they're here, and so you know like I said every time I've been to Chick Fil A it's been you know hey can I help you? you? You know, it's my pleasure to serve you. Is there anything else I can do for you? And so, you know, as a company that's kind of been instilled in, in what y'all do, I believe, because it's been every time, everywhere I go to Chick-fil-A. Um, and so that's something that I would like to be able to teach and instill in my students here as they're working with athletes and with coaches and that kind of thing. So anytime I can uh, get something from somebody that possibly has more experience than me, I'm going to, you know, jump on it. So right. feel, feel free to, you know, let the floodgates open. Well, you know. and a quick story here. My dad, when he was teaching, uh, there was another lady that used to teach in the same high school, and she actually teaches now in Pasadena. And she told me the other day when I talked with her, she said, you know what? You know what I learned from your dad, Luke? And I said, what did you learn from my dad? He said, well, my students would go to his class, and they kept turning to his homework and not uh, my homework. And so she goes, over the years, I finally figured out why that is. It's because he doesn't allow late work. 
And so he had that standard of, okay, you can't turn any late work. And she would kind of give him a day or two. And so the students responded by going, okay, I have to have his in because he's going to be mean and not let me turn it in late. And now, you know, but Miss, uh, this lady, they'll let her, they'll, she'll let me turn it in a little bit late. So if I have to choose between the two, I'll make sure I do, you know, my dad, Mr. Wilbanks, his work instead. And so now she's adopted that principle. She said, okay, I'm just going to set that standard and abide by it and just say, okay, this is the standard of excellence. We're not going to waver on that. And so that really it was eye-opening from that to hear that, you know, about my dad and about her as well. So. I'm, I'm jotting down notes in the show notes. So if y'all get to the show notes and see these things and that's Skip just it. me taking notes so I can remember what he said later. Crystal. Oh. Can you tell us uh, a time when you failed as a leader? Yes. Uh, I always hate to say how you fail, but I think everyone <laughs> fails. And like I said, if you want to look for people that fail, I've got to be there as well. Um, I think uh, we just had one recent one at Chick-fil-A. Uh, we had a lady, we had her, her work in the kitchen. She was doing an awesome job. And so we had thought about, I thought, you know, hey, she's going to do an excellent job. She's a great leader. Uh, maybe she can lead, help lead in the kitchen. And it was a little bit too early for her to lead because we ended up having to let her go. Um, and part of that was because of my failed leadership. Number one, I didn't recognize that she was not ready for leadership. And number two, we didn't coach her well enough because she had never really had any leadership experience. And so I kind of failed by going, okay, you're a great worker, but you may not be a great leader. And so there's a big difference between that. And so I think sometimes we promote people that are just doing the best job, whereas they may not be the best leader. And so that's where I kind of take the failure on that and said, all right, I did not do well in that. And so, and part of that was because I didn't listen to my other managers that knew better. And they said, well, let's wait, let's coach her a little bit. And I just kind of said, oh no, she'll be great. Let's go with it. And of course I was wrong. <laughs> Huh. All right. So, so on that, what are, what are some of the things that now looking back at that, that you would have said, you know, she's a great worker and she's doing really good here, but I don't know if she would be a good leader. What are some of the things that you would look for in a leader? Um, it's similar to the, I know there's a question coming up about applicants, but one thing is, uh, can you lead people? I know John Maxwell's definition of leadership is influence. You know, can you influence people? Uh, but I always love the, you know, what's the biggest characteristic of a leader is they got to have followers. You know, if you don't have any followers, I don't care what your name tag says or what your role is, you're not a leader. And so uh, I look back on that and I'm just like, okay, I need to do something different on that leadership part. And so when we look for leaders, we look for, is there people following them? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to win a popularity contest because they also, we also have had those as well, our share of those where they got a lot of followers, but they're not really leading them anywhere. And so uh, they don't have any direction. And so we really got to find the balance of that as someone that can really rally the troops, but also get them in the right direction as well. And so but people that have had that opportunity, uh, we've created another level of leadership, our, our third level. Uh, we have our top leaders and our midline managers and then our assistant uh, managers below that and basically that's a growing level for them we give them a little bit of responsibility and, and kind of see how they do that do they try to do it themselves or do they get help or what do they do and how they respond do they include other people and so because you can only grow the business as, as big as your uh, leadership capacity and so if I try to do it all myself we would not be at the sales volume we're at right now um, but fortunately I've got some great leaders that can help expand that so all right very good very good can you tell us of a time where you find uh, uh, you really noted as a leader? Yes, um, and I think we're experiencing this right now. Uh, when I first got here, we really focused on my top five leaders, and I've really started to release some responsibility and trust with them. And uh, we're starting to see some results that are really, really good as far as sales and people and just service within the organization. And uh, I feel like we've kind of hit that stride and they're starting to grow leaders uh, below them. And so I see it going from not just me getting great people that can run the unit and run the store and be good managers, but they're actually growing people underneath them. And so it's not easy, but I see them doing that as well. And we're starting to see the fruits of that. I'm excited about the next, actually the rest of this year. And so it was specifically the next six months. And so. Um, All right. What are a couple of tips for someone managing high school students? couple of tips managing high school students uh, be patient that's the biggest one um, as I get older I guess I get uh, not as nice and my patience my fuse grows shorter and I think I have to think about that and go okay you're a high school student you don't have real work experience um, unless you unless you're working in high school and so uh, they don't teach you about raising kids and all that kind of good jazz and so I always always give the um, idea about 
uh, when moms come in, our high school students don't realize about high chairs. When I worked at Chick-fil-A and I had high, uh, I looked at the high chairs and said, who uses those? And it was simply because I didn't have kids, so I didn't use them, so I thought everyone was like me. And so I had to realize that we have to coach high school students and say, okay, this is what your experiences are and what you've learned so far in, um, in, in your life. And so what is, how can we help you to get even better in that? And so does that help a little bit? <clears throat> what are some things that would make an applicant stand out to you? I thought about this, and I think it's kind of a trick question uh, <laughs> because I have two different answers. One for applicants that stand out just in an interview. Uh, nowadays, schools are doing such a great job at preparing people for interviews that it's hard to tell who's going to fail and who's going to do great. And so it's difficult. Uh, we, did, we do a lot of them. We hire probably out of every three that we hire, only one works out. And so, which I'm glad the schools are teaching how to interview, but I also want to teach how to keep people, to keep, have people keep the job. And so I got two sets here. So one is how would you best get the job? I look at attitude. Do you have a good attitude? I'm a very positive person. And when you find a very positive person, they really hate negative uh, people around them. And so it just drives me nuts. You know, if you, I'm like one of those that, you know, you tell me I can't do it. I'm going to go, oh, I can watch, you know, you can't do this much in sales or this much in profit. So attitude is big to me. Responsibility. Um, we have no room for babysitting in our restaurant. And so we've got 80 people to take care of. And there's no way I can teach you what your parents hopefully taught you um, to get to work on time, show up in uniform. You'd be surprised nowadays how many applicants come late to an interview. And they go, oh, well, I'm not usually late. I'm like, really? The most important part of getting a job and you show up late. And so it's just amazing to me. Uh, but attitude, responsibility, and then work ethic. Someone that can work hard. They're not afraid to get their hands dirty. Um, I, don't, I love that in uh, applicants. Now, in leaders, a couple of different things I look for in there. Um, they like to fail. And the reason, I, that, the reason I look for that is they're up to a challenge. I don't know if y'all play games, probably on the computer or whatever, and you always play a game and you always beat it, maybe on the beginner level, but maybe there's a game that you always play beginner and you never move up because you're like, ah, but I'm already winning. I don't want to lose, you know? And so I think failing shows me that you've been challenged. Um, and when if I ask you that in the interview, if you can tell me that you failed and that you've learned from it, then I know, okay, you're willing to take a risk to possibly win. And that's one of the reasons I actually asked for this store when it became available, because it was one of the top stores. And so I was like, okay, there's going to be a lot of great people asking for it. But I said, you know what? I haven't failed yet in that aspect, so I'm going to ask for it and just see what happens. And so um, I was excited when it actually worked out. And so, but someone that can make it happen, I think from the athletic realm, from the football field, from the soccer field or whatever, I also look for people who get in the game and play the game. Uh, I've noticed, especially in the service industry, there's a lot of people that want to tell you how to do things right, but they don't necessarily, necessarily want to fix it. And so I look for team members that can go, hey, Luke, this is a problem, but this is how we can fix it. I call them problem identifiers versus problem solvers. There's a lot of problem identifiers. They'll tell you what's going on. Um, anyone can tell you that. But the ones that actually come in there and go, hey, Luke, this is a problem, but this is how I fixed it, those are the ones I'm like, that's excellent. You know, even if it, even if it costs a lot of money, but you tried to fix it, I'm excited about it. It's like, okay, you at least had the initiative to try and fix it. And so that's kind of the key attributes we look for in the interview. But like I said, nowadays it's the next 30 days after you're hired are the most important to me because we want to see, did you follow through with that interview? Because I always hear people in the interview go, well, I'm a great people person. I love to smile. Uh, quick interview story. One of my favorite interviews was somebody, uh, I, I usually go through the uniform, what you have to wear. And when I did a lot of interviews and I said, you know, black shirt, black pants, we, uh, we can get you black shoes and a smile. And so I included in that. And a lot of people did exactly what you do. You smile, you know, at that point in the interview, well, this guy looks at me and he goes, no, a lady, uh, there's two different ones. A lady goes, well, I don't smile. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I thought, okay, all right, well, we're at Chick-fil-A. And so I thought maybe physically she just really can't smile. So, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be nice about that. So I said, you know, is there something, a reason you can't smile? No, I just don't like to smile. Said, well, I'm sorry, you have to smile at Chick-fil-A. And she goes, well, what about the kitchen? I said, no, we like to have fun in the kitchen, too. you got to be able to smile. So uh, needless to say, she did not get hired. <laughs> um, but it's just amazing, just those small things um, in the interview process that you learn. Um, to look for so <laughs> why would she even say that who doesn't smile the, though I know. the other guy goes uh, asked him the same question he goes I smile all the time <laughs> if you're just hearing the broadcast uh, he didn't smile at all and so I thought he was playing a joke on me okay you know he's just real serious his face he goes, I smile all the time and I'm in my brain I'm just cracking up because I'm like seriously dude <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I asked him again. So I, I go, really? You smile all the time? He's like, all the time. Like, well, you're scared to death something because you're not smiling right now. <laughs> and so, but hopefully you learn from it. We'll see. <laughs> oh. I, all right. Yeah, hang on. I know um, I've been, I listened to the Dave Ramsey podcast. And one, one of the times he was talking about um, the interview process like is the most important like if you're going to succeed then then you know they have like two or three or four different interviews that you have to interview with different people um and so i'm wondering if if that's one of the ways that here as a student athletic trainer um if that's something they need to experience something we need to set up to where they you know they have the application and then they have an interview and then maybe a, a second interview uh for being a student trainer student athletic trainer um, I'm wondering how that would how that would pan out. Um, you guys typically just have one interview, or we actually don't. We I do sometimes just do one, but most majority of the time we try to get at least two or three interviews. And some of them are uh, official. We try to at least do two official interviews, but we try to watch everything we can. Um, and at my last store, we got to a point, and we'll get there at this point as where as at, at this store as well, is to where we don't we don't hire you unless someone working for us knows you. And so we were able to get that good of a team that we said, okay, if you don't know anybody working here, then we can't get a good reference on you. But we look at when you turn in your application. I mean, I've had people who try to turn in an application in the middle of lunchtime. Or they'll come up, they'll ask for an application, then they'll go, do you have a pen? And they go, you, you know you were coming to get an application and that it's probably going to need a pen to fill out, right? And so I usually don't give them a pen for that because, okay, you're not prepared for that. But then they come in the middle of lunchtime and they, and they want to turn it back in and go, okay, so when will I hear back from you? And I just want to say, okay, in order to hire people, we have to make money. I mean, it's not like we have, you know, the government, we can just give <laughs> money away. Um, like anything, we have to actually make money. And so I'm like, so you're coming in the middle of lunchtime or middle of dinner time, and you want to get hired. So I'm having to take time out to help you when I could be helping a guest who's going to give us more money, which could open up a spot for you. And so just thinking of stuff like that. But, yeah, we try to capture as much data as possible from what they wear to the interview. You know, did they prepare themselves or do they just think they're just walking in just to get a job? But then if they know somebody, if they know somebody, that's really important because we can really kind of go, hey, would you recommend this person? And if they, if they say yes, then great. And so, yeah, I think multiple interviews really, really help. And so I love Dave Ramsey and I support that. Um, and so I think he does a great job at, you know, being able to say, hey, and I think his, his talent is probably high enough now to where he can really do several interviews because he probably has a big talent pool, kind of like Chick-fil-A as operator, and he can kind of pull the very best. And so I think that's what you get when you start doing a lot of interviews. You really get to see different perspectives. And so we had a, we had a guy we wanted to promote, and in our leadership team we talked about him, and one manager really thought he would do a great job. And the rest of us, we were a little weary, a leery of it, but we let her go ahead and do it. And uh, he ended up being promoted. Now he's one of our top leaders at nighttime. And so we were all weary of it and, you know, weren't sure about it. And then finally, he's doing a really good job. So we were surprised. And so I think that's, you may screen out some people, especially if you have multiple interviews, but you may realize that, okay, I thought he was bad, but you thought he was really good. Let's give him a shot and see what happens. And so that can be the benefit of multiple, interview, multiple interviews as well. And it kind of comes back to what you said, being willing to fail, willing to take a shot. You know, I mean, you're at least giving them a shot. And if they can't handle it, you can either move them back down or say, see you Right. So. I have a question. I do. So, oh, like, you know how you said that it bothers you whenever they come in at certain times? Then what time <laughs> would you think that you should come in? Well, think about the business. You know, at a restaurant business, we were busy breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I would definitely say before or after. Um, schools, I try not to call a school right at 8 o'clock in the morning if, you know, if we're doing billing or we're trying to market or something like that because I know they're handling all kinds of admission work and stuff like that. And uh, so just kind of think about whatever business you're applying for, whether it's a restaurant or not. Um, but for us, in the morning, in the afternoon time, that's when we're going to actually have some time available. And so we're still nice and cordial to those, but that's just something that, you know, if we remember that when you come in and you turn in your application then, then that may be a strike against you. It's not, it's not like we're not going to hire you, but – what that shows me is that you're not being uh, nice to the, you can't recognize the needs of the guest, you know? And so on that point. Answer your question, Caitlin. Yeah. When Are you, you coming in for an interview? Oh, I don't know. Oh, well, okay. I All right. It's because <laughs> I, I have an interview on Tuesday. Okay. At Chick-fil-A? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have open interviews. I'm not sure when the next date is. We have uh, open interviews once a week, and so if, even if you just want to test your interview skills, you can always come in and do that. So. Mm. Cool. Very cool. What do you feel is your biggest achievement 
<laughs> biggest achievement. Uh, I think besides my family, I thought about that because I was dressing my boys this morning or helping my wife dress my boys, and they were a little crazy. And so, uh, but I think my kids right now, hopefully 10 years from now, they'll, they'll be well-behaved and contributors to society. But a couple things with Chick-fil-A. I think being at one of the top Chick-fil-A's in the chain is one of my biggest achievements. But then also they have an award called the Champions Club Award, and it rewards sales and profit. And in my last tour, we did that uh, my final full year that I was there. And so I was real proud of that because you don't do that easily. Um, I look at people in our chain that win that award, and they're really the ones that make it happen. And so I think that may be uh, professionally one of my biggest achievements that I've had so far. Hopefully not the last one, though. Yep. So what about, what about personally biggest achievement? If you met my wife, mm -hmm. probably getting married to her. And so, <laughs> um, we got we got married, and I just realized uh, somebody was telling me they were talking to her last night at our, one of our events. We had at the store, and they said, "I just love talking to Betsy," and I said, "I do too." <laughs> <laughs> I think I really, I think a lot of guys are in this boat. I think I really married over my head, and so uh, she does an excellent job raising the boys. And so I tell people, my kids, uh, I wouldn't be as successful professionally if if I didn't have my wife at home helping me out uh, with the boys at home, and so uh, achievement there as well. So. Yeah, very cool. very cool. I feel the same way. And I, I mean, especially these kids here, they know I, I talk about my wife all the time. And, uh, you know, she comes up and supports us, stuff like that. So I'm right there with you. I agree that I'm over my head. But awesome. I've definitely, definitely my biggest achievement was marrying my beautiful wife. So yes, very cool. You're only the owner at the one on Fairmont? That is correct. Chick-fil-A usually uh, limits how many you can own, which is, I mean, one Chick-fil-A is more than enough for anybody um, as far as people-wise and money as mm -hmm. well, and so uh, most of the time. But, uh, yeah, I've just owned, I've owned three different ones, but I've given up the past ones to go to the next one. And so I started out in the mall as an owner, and then I went to the one in Nacogdoches, and then this one currently. So. Oh, that's cool. All right, so I've been to Chick-fil-A several different times and seen you there. Um, what kind of hours as an owner of chick-fil-a do you typically put in this is always a great question especially when you talk to students and they go you're the owner that means you get to set your own hours right and yes and no because a lot of times the business sets my hours as well um, now that i've got a great leadership team it's a whole lot easier to do but before if something went wrong guess who was called it was me. Oh, and so uh, if the alarm on our uh, store went off at, at 4 in the morning, guess who got up to go visit? Yeah. It was me. <laughs> and so, so I love to say I don't work a lot. My wife would tell you otherwise. Um, in the business world, I'm thinking, and you're probably doing this as well, um, in the training world, you're always thinking about, okay, how can we be better? And so I'll take my wife out on a date. Um, we still date. It. We try to go out on a date once a week. And we'll go to a restaurant. And the whole time, you know, I'm trying to listen to her, but I'm watching the service as well. You know, okay, how can we do that better at our store? You know, and so mind-wise, I'm probably always thinking about that, except for Sunday. I've been getting really good about turning off the brain on Sunday and uh, attending church and stuff like that. Um, but I would say... 40 to 60 hours a week and when I first started at Chick-fil-A at my first restaurant I was probably closer to 80 and so it's one of those things that uh, the mall I had was open at 9 and it closed at 9 so I could work 12 hours and work the whole day and so it's not near as much now and I'm starting to take more days off and more time off uh, I'm thankful to my leadership team because of that and so because it wouldn't happen so yeah I really like that idea because I mean if you have a good foundation and you, you like you said you can hand off responsibility and now somebody else can open and somebody else can close and you can you can do the uh, be the face of the company where you're out at the schools and doing the great chicken kick or, or coming here and talking to our students and stuff like that. So Right. And that's not easy to do. I had to learn that the hard way. Um, right. Because I grew up in a house that taught you if you want it done right, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard that before? Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'm going to do it all myself because I'm going to do it the best. And then one of the hard things was passing off some responsibility and going, okay, you may not do it the way that I think it's supposed to be done. But you're going to do it great. And, and I'm starting to learn that there are a whole lot of people that are, there are a lot of people out there that are smarter and better than me. If I would just give them a chance, it would actually turn out better. And so uh, that's been really good with my top leadership team, giving them some ideas. And last night we had a rodeo night, and I really had no, uh, no help with the planning. And it's the first time I've ever done that. I've usually been real involved in the planning of it. And uh, my marketing director, who's been with me three months, and then the uh, other managers, 
it was it was a little rocky at some points, but it was a great night. I had some great comments and feedback on that, and so I was really excited that okay, I didn't do anything in that, and it was excellent. And that's that, for me one of the hardest leadership lessons to learn, and I'm still learning it today. So, all right, so I need to I need to go through some leadership training so I can teach my student trainers how to lead, so that when they get to be seniors, they they can just kind of take over the whole management process, and I can just sit back and supervise. There we go. So I'm gonna be like Luke. That's my that's my goal. <laughs> I don't know if that's a high goal for you, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> is y'all's lemonade homemade? It is. Well, store made. Um, we squeeze the lemons. It's got lemonade or lemon juice, sugar, and water, and that's it. I mean, the recipe is pretty simple. And so we squeeze the lemons there every morning. We squeeze about eight cases of lemons, and so a day. And so we go through a lot of lemonade because it's good. It's not the powder <laughs> stuff. And so, but it's lemon juice, um, water, and sugar. And so, yeah, you like it? Yeah. yeah so, All right, so on that, do y'all have a, 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 something that peels them and squeezes them, or do you have somebody that peels them or what? We manually cut them every day. Now, we do have a squeezer machine. Everyone know the one where you've seen mm -hmm. one that you can squeeze one at a time. We don't right. do that. <laughs> uh, but we have one, a mechanical one that the inside spins, but it looks exactly like that, but it spins. And so we take the cut lemon, we put half of it on there, kind of press down and turn it, and then do the other one. And so my kitchen manager, she's a beast at doing those, and she can do like eight cases in an hour. And so it's pretty amazing how much juice you can do. Uh, make lemonade for a day chick-fil-a yeah because we started making our own uh homemade orange juice or home squeeze orange juice and so i was just wondering if there's a more efficient way i'm always <laughs> looking i was looking on youtube like come on there's got to be a better way to do this so yes all right i think caitlin has got the last question before they get to go to lunch how does chick-fil-a prepare students for college a couple different things i think the leadership opportunities uh mine two night managers they're actually both still in high school and so we're giving them some opportunity to lead um, in that aspect. Uh, but also one thing that we give is that we have, there's an Estuary at Cathy scholarship, and it's a $1,000 scholarship. And basically if you work for Chick-fil-A, your junior and senior year of high school, about 20 hours a week, you basically get it. And so I received that scholarship. And so $1,000 won't pay for college, but it sure doesn't hurt. And so that's one way we really help out. And so I think we... I really try to prepare the students and really just kind of get them to talk with people. And so it's been amazing how many introverts we've hired and they come out of their shell on that front counter and they just get to talk with the guests and they learn those people skills. Cause I don't care what you're going to do. You're going to have to get an interview at some point and you have to talk with people. And so the best accountants and the best lawyers, the best uh, engineers that I've met are ones that can talk with people. Not only do they do their skills really well, but they can talk with people, whether it's the customers, whether it's their boss, <laughs> I'm mean, going to have to talk with them as well. And so that's where I kind of see that. And I think just holding students accountable, you know, we, we fire people when they need to be fired. If they're not doing a good job, I've seen some people take that and they get better at it. And so I think that's one way that we can prepare, prepare them for college. We've got a lot of college students that work for us um, and we try to work around their schedules as much as possible. We realize that the people that are doing everything, they're involved in everything. They're the ones. They're the best. Team, they're the best team members to have. We've we've had interviewed some people, and they go, "Man, I can work any time all day because I have nothing to do." <laughs> like you have nothing. You're not involved in it. No, man, I'm wide open. I can help out as much as possible. They're usually the ones that aren't the best because they're like, "Oh yeah, they're, they're not making themselves better as a people person. They're not doing any kind of college. Not doing any kind of work to better themselves." And so, they just want a little bit of money, and that's it. You know, and so we've kind of stayed away from that. You know, you've heard the saying, if you want something done, ask a busy person to do it because they're the ones that will find time in their schedule to make it happen. You know, because if you don't have anything to do, you're kind of like, oh, well, I'll do that later. And so, but uh, hopefully we help prepare people for college. I mean, it is a business, so we're in business to make money. And so hopefully we hold people to the excellent standards and people leave Chick-fil-A uh, on good terms, whether it's they're getting a better job. Uh, some people start with me. I've got a couple right now that want to be Chick-fil-A operators. And so they're working on their degree and you know, finish that up and then we'll see where it goes from there. And so hopefully we can uh, get them in that role. Yep. Very cool. All right. We have all right, any, anybody, are there any questions on there? Karen? Mm -hmm. No. All right. Any parting questions for, for Luke or Mr. Wilbanks before we, before I let you guys go. Why do y'all close on Sundays? Close on Sundays. Uh, Truett Cathy started that with uh, his first restaurant. He said he started working six or seven days a week, and then he realized that we need a break. <laughs> and so um, that's part of it. But then also his strong faith convi convictions in mind as well allow the team members some time off. And so you get a guaranteed day off. And for me as an operator, it's the best thing that I could ever 
say about Chick-fil-A because it allows me to time with my family for sure on Sundays. Now, every now and then we work on Sundays. Um, we don't open, uh, but you can. Uh, we'll do some work or something like that or do some training or something. Uh, and those days I just feel bad because I go, man, this is my day of rest. And so, but he started that when the company started, and I, I'm glad he stuck by it. And so I think we do more in six days than most restaurants do in seven. So. All right. All right, All right so... What about a free chicken question? Does anybody, no one asked me. Most of the time I get students asking me. Can I have I, free chicken, please? There we go. We were told not to ask. <laughs> yes, I oh, told them not to ask. Oh, very See, nice. I'm trying to teach them nice. to, you know. You are, that is a great thing. But I do have some for everyone here. And so I've got a coupon. Not real chicken. It's a coupon for one. Don't <laughs> but you still get a free I got and so, Yeah, we got it. So I'll make sure. Sorry, all the listeners out there, you don't get it. But um, <laughs> the people in the studio will. <laughs> very cool very cool all right well i'm gonna uh turn will you susie will you turn all the mics down but mine and the guests are kayla just turn them all down but just leave one it should be one in four i think you leave up my stomach's been growling the whole interview <laughs> it's an interview um no podcast no 16 oh yeah uh, you can we can hire us actually in the state of Texas as young as 14, but we typically start at 16. Yeah, so if we if you know somebody and you're an all star, we may start at you early, but uh, for the most part, regulations are 16. All right, if y'all sit your head on the chairs. My pleasure. Luke, you, you can set your headphones down and I'll, I'll okay, close that good. one if you want. All right, so if you're watching live, Mr. Wilbanks is passing out free Chick-fil-A coupons. So if you can get here in the next 45 seconds, maybe you can have one, but probably not because these girls are, are taking them up fast. Never tried chicken. Right, what? I want to see you there, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We get everybody. All right. All right. Well, do you have any any parting thoughts? I think you had a great group of kids, and so what you're doing, I think, is working, and so I was very impressed. Most of the classes I talked to, about half of them really work out. So. What do you guys do? Free chicken money. Chick-fil-A. All you got to do is smile. There we go. <laughs> I don't smile. <laughs> <laughs> Ever, right? <laughs> so, I was uh, real impressed with the students, by the way. And so, a lot, of, a lot of classes I talk to, there's about half that do really well, and then probably 40% that are okay, and then 10% that I can tell by the handshake and just watching that we would never hire them. Yeah. But uh, everyone here seemed to be very attentive and courteous. Well, so I'm, I'm working. Job. I'm working. You did an excellent job there. So. so. All right, very cool. All right, well, if you'll stick with me for just a second, I'm going to close it out. Um, we are to the end of the show, so there's a couple people. Uh, Memorial Herman Hospital Southeast, they've done a whole lot to support us, and I want to thank them. Uh, ghats.org has sponsored our CEUs, so athletic trainers. Uh, you can learn how to improve your athletic training, student athletic training program, or if you're a professional, how you can hire you know more professional athletic trainers by listening to some of what we had to uh, say today. Um, and get your CEUs from ghats.org. And then Chick-fil-A, like I said, mentioned earlier, they do a whole lot to support our uh, school district and our, our area. And so um, I will absolutely continue to support Chick-fil-A because I love the food, but also I love what they stand for. The, you know, the Sunday, the day off, the day either you can choose to go to church and worship or you can just choose to spend time uh, with your family. And so just that mindset, but also, again, everything that they do to support us and then, you know, Luke taking his time out of it as a busy day, like you said, 40, 60 hours a week and coming over here to talk to us uh, is real cool. So uh, our, our website, I've mentioned, I mentioned yesterday, it's www.sportsmedicinebroadcast.com. So it's relatively new, but it's pretty much got everything on there that you need. Um, almost every Wednesday we're live, except for when there's testing or when there's uh, some sort of failure. Then Twitter is PHS Sports Med. Google Plus is Sports Medicine Broadcast. I talked about that yesterday. So I've changed the name of that on Google Plus. The page is Sports Medicine Broadcast. Facebook.com slash PHS Athletic Training. The office phone is 713-740-0310, extension 01312. And then the, the uh, 
PHS Athletic Training app on Android if you want to download and listen to all the podcasts in one place. So I think I have all that on there. And so for Jeremy, the Sports Medicine One Kids, Mr. Luke Wilbanks, owner and operator of the local Pasadena Chick-fil-A, that's a wrap.